It's just, no, it's the fault, right? Yes, it's okay. We'll restart. Yes. If you have concussion, then I will add more minutes. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, actually, what I'm going to, you know, present uh, is just a, a kind of giving expression to the work of a whole group of distinguished scholars, dear friends and colleagues that have been contributing to shaping this, uh, this work and the publication to date of 16 volumes. And this includes an introductory volume of studies that initiated the series in 2008. And now we are uh, at a stage, and here, you know, it's a good occasion because I could uh, point to uh, Omar to uh, finalize the work on the 16th volume of the critical edition and annotated English translation with commentaries, which uh, is due to be published at the beginnings of 2023. Uh, many of the um, Colleagues who have contributed to uh, various volumes uh, are present with us today. Uh, Professor Carmela Bafioni, Professor Godfrado Kalatai, Professor Ismail Punawala, Professor Paul Walker, and many others uh, who would have been otherwise with us, including the guidance that we received through uh, Professor uh, Wilfred Madalong, Herman Landolt, and the support of people that are no longer with us, like Professor Abbas Hamdani, Patricia Crony, and many other dear colleagues who are continuing the work or who have already contributed to it, including figures like Ian Netan, uh, James Montgomery, and uh, Len Goodman. And, and Noha, Noha, definitely, but Noha is going to be brought within the fold for further work. And this work couldn't have been undertaken without the full support of Dr. Farhad Daftari throughout the journey from the point it started as an idea to publish a translation of Rasa'il uh, Ikhwan al Safa. Originally, it was a translation of the Sadr uh, publication, but then it, transformed, it became transformed into a full project for establishing the critical editions and basing the translations on. Uh, these edited texts. And I recall, you know, it just came to my mind today that uh, the day I got the main CDs from Istanbul, um, it marked another kind of uh, event that, uh, you know, meant something to me personally. It was the death of Jack uh, Derrida. It was in October 2004. So it gives you a sort of an indication of when all of this started as a, as a project. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the contents of the corpus uh, because by itself, you know, it would require a lot of, uh, you know, uh, engagement with uh, history of ideas, the way it could be situated within its, uh, its uh, Islamicate context, but also against the background of Hellenistic thought and in particular neo-Pythagorean uh, traditions. Uh, and the various uh, niceties that relate to the way they articulate their understanding of cosmology, their take on ontotheology, or even you know uh, how do we acquire uh, veridical conditions for uh, ascertaining knowledge. So a, a form of an epistemic project that is at work within the the corpus. Uh, what I'm, you know, going to hint at is uh, what we uh, still expect uh, ultimately after the completion of the work in terms of the further uh, research that will be undertaken by the group that was involved in the critical edition and uh, translation and commentaries, uh, which is to hopefully organize a conference. And this can happen as we are uh, finishing the, uh, the volumes. So we are hoping that uh, we could conclude this project uh, within three years from now. So far, 40, two years, two years? 2025. Yeah, 2025. <laughs> um, so uh, 40 epistles uh, have been uh, so far published uh, and there's 12 remaining, but within what is yet to come, there's two volumes on epistle 52 
which has already had 52A, will have 52B, 52C, just to highlight the complexities that we are encountering in uh, dealing with uh, uh, manuscripts and certain parts of the corpus that by their very nature are far more complex in terms of the issues of transmission and divergence from what we might take to be the closest to an original. So all our endeavor is an approximation of a text and trying to understand uh, the context in which it was uh, uh, shaped and uh, the transmission. And we have to further uh, look into uh, aspects that relate to dating, authorship, and uh, going in depth in terms of the contents based on what we have uh, accomplished so far. So hopefully this can take place in the context of a conference that could lead to the publication of a capping volume uh, similar to the one that initiated the, the series. But this uh, doesn't conclude the work. The next generation of scholars uh, should start uh, the engagement with this corpus at a level that is much deeper than uh, an attempt to document and archive a tradition. It has many components in it that could reverberate with concerns that are still with us as part of our lived experience, as part of the epistemic landscape within which we find ourselves in, in terms of intercultural aspects, in terms of the way we relate to the mathematization of the manner we understand reality, uh, aspects that relate to ethics, the concerns over ecology and environment. Many lessons can be derived from this corpus, but they require tools of inquiry that go beyond historiography, codicology, and uh, the engagements that so far have uh, impacted you know, the way we conduct our work as the group of researchers who are establishing the text. But ultimately, this is a call for uh, across the institute, for those who are even working on modern aspects that relate to culture, to uh, aspects of identity, to concerns over climate, to decolonization, to look at the corpus from a perspective that starts to derive elements from it that can guide uh, the articulation of conceptual frameworks that are derived from the tradition. And I'm not saying this in a way that would betray uh, the content and decontextualize it, but I'm saying that the merits of the oeuvre are not just the, uh, you know, a, uh, the production of an element of documenting the tradition in its context, but it has certain facets that can be part of the lived experience for intellectuals and new generation of scholars. And um, based on that, I also call upon uh, all the scholars that are present with us to uh, highlight the merits of this, uh, this work, because to tell you the truth, you know, these days, uh, we, we have to take into account how much the, uh, the publications that we are producing are being circulated in the networks of research, how much they receive citations, what kind of impact metrics are uh, deployed to understand the merits of the work. And I know this is not uh, uh, an aspect that academicians are usually, especially from the humanities, look at favorably, but this is regrettably the reality of the academic environment that we encounter. So uh, we, need, we need to promote more uh, this uh, beyond the circles of scholarship that are more or less conventional within our uh, small subfield within uh, Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kinsley. <clears throat> You did not consume your injury time, but you allow us to have more time for discussion, for which we all thank you. Our next speaker is uh, <coughs> Professor Kodofa de Kalatai. Please defer to Thank you. I'm waiting for the PowerPoint. <laughs> ah, okay. The floor is yours. But in the mind, meantime, mind. let me. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful conference. I also would like to thank Nader in particular for introducing the audience to this corpus, uh, the Juana Safa, and to the OU, this OUPIIS project. Uh, 
it's very helpful. <laughs> and in, in my case, it's very I ideal uh, because it means that I will not have to go through the same uh, explanation again. And so I can directly go to my topic. Um, and my topic, if I can have, yes, I think here we are. So my topic is discussing some aspects of the problems affecting the really last the real last part of the corpus i mean from episode uh, 48 to uh, 52 i have the impression uh, that this last part is especially problematic in terms of uh, addition transmission and 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 so on this is what i would like to show you uh, today um so we will be concerned here exclusively with these five um, uh, last epistles. Epistle 40, uh, 48, the call to God, uh, which provides in the manuscript tradition various uh, arrangements of chapters. So is that already something a bit complicated? We will see that epistle uh, 49 on spiritual beings is known in two uh, versions. Uh, or even uh, three, uh, we, we can say, we shall see that later. Um, episode 50 on the species of governance uh, provides very difficult things. Uh, we have ambiguous references to the Risale del Jamia. Uh, we have one manuscript, uh, one manuscript having an alternative version, and we have also, among other things, one manuscript presenting a very important and intriguing esoteric addition as um, Carmel Labafioni uh, has shown in, in the, her, her edition. Uh, then moving to Epistle 51, we will see that here we have an epistle known in two or three different uh, versions. And last but not least, we have Epistle 52 on magic, which is now known in three different uh, versions. So let's go into bit more of detail of this, starting with Epistle uh, 48, the call to God. So no need to say that this is a very important epistle and that it is really marked in terms of doctrinal of doctrine. It's the epistle which seems to be written by a hidden imam. It's also an epistle where you can find this very important uh, passage on the conjunction, uh, forthcoming conjunction, uh, which is meant to, uh, so to speak, uh, to herald the way out of the cave where the sleepers live, and the sleepers are the Ikhwan Safa. Um, so uh, Abbas Amdani, who edited this uh, epistle, ranged the manuscript tradition in two broad uh, families. One is with uh, Atif Effendi, which is the oldest manuscript known of the Ikhwan Safa, plus a certain number of other uh, manuscripts, and another with other authoritative manuscripts and coincide with the three uncritical uh, editions, BCB for Bombay, Cairo, and uh, Beirut. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in the view of uh, Abbas Hamdani, uh, this second family was something like her earlier. Uh, he says that uh, these manuscripts follow a kind of earlier Ismaili exemplar, uh, whereas the other one, the, 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 the tradition with uh, Atif Effendi, uh, he believed that, uh, that was his opinion, that uh, he took that for, as a rearrangement uh, for a Sunni Sufi uh, audience. Then, more recently, Omar uh, Ali de Onzaga refined this classification on the basis of other manuscripts which were not part of the project, but which he found and consulted here in the Library of the Islamic of the Institute of, Is, uh, of Ismaili uh, Studies, and he arranged these uh, manuscripts into three groups: A, B, C. I will not enter into the detail, but it is according to the arrangement of four blocks of chapters. Uh, and uh, he doesn't. He, he prudently refrains from pronouncing himself on the who who was first, who who came later. But uh, he is quite clear that one of these groups is much more Ismaili orientated than the others. So I will let him uh, explain that to us here. <laughs> he says manuscripts 1040 and the group uh, and group A 
are more explicitly smiley as they lay the emphasis on the imam's description of the different groups of the Shia and how they relate to him by placing those passages at the very start of the epistle. There is no doubt that this group is more likely to have circulated in Ismaili circles, judging by the provenance of the IIS manuscripts and the Jiwahan edition. Jiwahan is uh, another uh, way to refer to the Bombay edition. Then we may move to uh, Epistle 49 on the spiritual beings that was edited by uh, um, Cyril Uwe. Uh, and um, we, we find that there are two versions. A short version, 49a, uh, uh, represented by some manuscripts, and another one, a long version, represented by Atif Effendi, once again, uh, the oldest manuscript, plus a certain number of, of authoritative <coughs> manuscripts. Uh, I will also let him <laughs> explain uh, the difference between the two versions. He says, the short version advances sustained arguments vis-a-vis -vis the role of uh, natural and psychical faculties, as well as copious corpus Quranic evidence for the existence of the soul. In other words, the short version of the text is less with the structure and implications of the material and immaterial hierarchies. Moreover, while the long version occasionally adopts an exhortative tone, the short version of the text maintains a distinctly polemical register throughout. So once again, a complicated tradition. Now we move to perhaps the most complicated tradition. No, perhaps no, 52 is also a very complicated. It's uh, the Epistle 50 on the Species of Governance, edited by Carmela uh, Baffioni some time ago. Um, no need to insist on the very importance of the big, the great importance of this uh, epistle. Uh, it seems it, it contains a kind of address to uh, Hujat Allah and uh, speculations to see uh, is, is, is it an imam, is it a, the Qa'im of resurrection, many things possible. Uh, and also it includes a, a, a very famous passage on feasts and rituals, philosophical feasts, religious feasts, and the Feast of the Brethren of Purity, as the text uh, has it. And uh, it has attracted the attention of many scholars since uh, Henri Corbin. Um, well, once again, complications here. We have an alternative <laughs> version with respect, let's say, to the well, the standard version in one manuscript, and this is uh, Rhein, which uh, appears to be a kind of summary of the whole encyclopedia. Uh, and as I mentioned before, a long esoteric edition in another manuscript. Uh, and this is uh, the manuscript uh, Aleph. Um, and then with respect to uh, uh, the earlier manuscript, uh, the earliest manuscript, Atif, very, uh, a, a number of uh, important variations which are clearly Ismaili orientated. Um, and these are the manuscripts that you can uh, see here, and which led Carmela Baffioni to say, uh, because she uh, based our edition mainly on uh, Atif Effendi, she says in the introduction, the critical apparatus will show that almost all the passages that encouraged uh, former scholars to provide esoteric interpretation of Epistle 50 and of the rituals there described in particular are not found in the Atif manuscript. And then we have the thing about the references or uh, allusions or reference to what could be uh, uh, the Risat al Jamia in Epistle 50. So let me explain that a little bit. Uh, all manuscripts agree on the fact that in the very first chapter, uh, the epistle refers to itself as a chapter, fossil, the intent and goal of these epistles of ours. But then later on, in the same section, we have a big difference because in Atif Effendi, uh, the, it's still a, a comprehensive chapter, Al Fasl al Jami, but in other manuscripts like Lam and Noon, it's not a, a chapter. It's the comprehensive epistle, Al Risalat al Jamia, which, is, uh, which appears there in the text. And this, this coincides with what we have in Beirut in the uncritical edition of uh, uh, Bombay, Cairo, and Beirut, where and in those manuscripts as well, you find also the observation that it is outside the collection of epistles and that it's only after having read the 51 epistles that we can read uh, these uh, comprehensive chapters. 
Um, now, uh, very recently, Jana Matila published an important article on the authorship of the Risale del Germia. Um, he points out these passages uh, at the beginning of Epistle 50 as containing, oh, sorry, what was the problem here? We lost the connection with the PowerPoint. No, I didn't. Nothing. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so you should add me one yeah. minute. <laughs> uh, pointing out this, this passage as containing by far the longest description of the relation between the Rasari Khan Safa and the Risat al Jamia within the epistle themselves. But what he did was also to compare old manuscripts, Atif, FND, and another one he calls uh, Sotheby. Uh, with the Beirut edition. And it appears from this uh, uh, com comparison of uh, manuscript that he could find that only six references appear to be not interpolated uh, references to the Risale del Jamia. And what is more, he shows very convincingly that there, these not interpolated references are all to be found in this last part of the, of the corpus. One is in Epistle 49, one is in Epistle 50, and four in Epistle 52b. Uh, 52.1 now, the arrangement of the world. So this was edited by uh, Nua al Shar. Uh, once again, we have uh, an, a version found in some manuscripts, including plus a certain number of manuscripts, uh, and another one uh, found in other manuscripts which were uh, part of the project, plus some uh, other manuscripts uh, from the IIS collection, and which once again coincide with the tradition found in the three uncritical edition. And we can even say that there is a, a third uh, version, because there is one manuscript where we find uh, the, the other two versions, uh, not side by side, but just one after the other. So I will <laughs> let her once again uh, tell us about the difference between the two versions. Looking at version A and B of Epistle 51, in light of the larger corpus of the Rasail, version A repeats Epistle 32b with variations and additions in places, while version B of Epistle 51 appears to repeat with variations and additions parts of Epistle 34, the universe is a macroanthropos. Um, According, uh, well, she uh, follows more or less what uh, Abbas Hamdani suggested for uh, the, the, the two, the two uh, traditions. One is supposed to follow uh, an earlier Ismaili exemplar, and the other one with Atif Effendi is held to be a rearrangement for a Sufi Sunni audience. But in my view, um, and not only mine. Uh, this epistle has, shows many problems. It's clearly out of place. It's also completely redundant in the in in, in the corpus. So I would I would be very much inclined to see it as not part of the original comp compilation. How much uh, time do I have still? Plenty. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we move to epistle fifty two uh, on magic, which as uh, Nader mentioned, has not been published yet, or, well, only uh, 52a, the short version, has been published, that was 10 years ago, but the other two versions are forthcoming, hopefully, uh, in, the, in, in, in the collection. So it's true that in 10 years, or a bit more, years ago, uh, I published with Bruno Alflans the uh, edition of what is, what was, what we referred at that time as the short version, uh, on the basis of two manuscripts at that time, and also uh, it coincides with the uncritical editions. But then in the meantime, or since, uh, some other manuscripts have been uh, found uh, with this version. And as for example, this one, uh, Rajib Basha in, in Istanbul, uh, which has the particularity to uh, present uh, 52A and 52B, uh, one after the other. Uh, 52b uh, is found in all these manuscripts, so at if Effendi once again, plus a, a, a great number of manuscripts, and we even find a third version, completely different, 
but which is also present in one of these manuscripts and which is uh, 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 which will be published as part of the same volume and it's Jana Matilla who uh, took charge of, of the edition of this. Uh, things are even further complicated by 52b itself manuscripts divide into two further subcategories it's, it's becoming very complicated i'm sorry for that uh, we have uh, group a and group b that all manuscripts more or less agree on the very first part well half half of it and it's a very long uh, epistle um, but completely disagree with one another on the second half of the epistle once again we have an opposition between additive and a series of manuscripts, not necessarily the same as before, uh, and group B uh, with other uh, manuscripts and the uncritical edition. Uh, regarding the contents of these three versions, we can see that they are, they are completely different from one another. 52A appears to be a mere catalogue of quotations, uh, there are quotations from Plato, from the Quran, from Abu Mashar, from the Jewish religious tradition, and of course the pièce de résistance, which is uh, the report on the Sabians of Haran, and other uh, quotations of, the, of, the, uh, of that kind. 52b, so, yes, okay, <laughs> turns out to be uh, an incredible patchwork of many different things. It's extremely heterogeneous. Um, it is. It consists mainly of uh, um, recipes, or, or uh, how shall I say that? Yes, interrogative, uh, very pedestrian interrogative astrology, very technical, but at the same time with sections which are clearly written in the style of the Ikhwan Safa, and also with uh, many so to speak, Ismaili-like uh, reflection on, on, uh, on the soul and, and its destiny. And then we have 52C, which is something completely different again, um, which is not philosophical at all, not at all, not at all, uh, but which is more focused on Arab Islamic uh, things uh, and divided into <laughs> relatively clear sections that you can find it here. So I will speed up a little bit. Once again, I will quote uh, from Jana Matilla, who says, and I agree completely with him, the three versions of the Epistle on Magic are textually completely independent. In the manuscript, they are always transmitted separately. Uh, textual elements and there are, uh, sorry, <laughs> there's something I can't read here, <laughs> but anyway, textual element, and there are surprisingly little commonalities, even as regards their structure and <laughs> contents. In other words, they clearly appear to be mutually exclusive. Um, I have some problems to go to, to move to the next slide. Ah, yes, here, here it is. So, yes. Um, so do, do these, um, um, versions have some link with the rest of the corpus? No, apparently not. All three versions show very big discrepancies from the rest of the Rasa'il as a whole. I will just, in, in the style, in the, in, in, in the vocabulary, I will just show one example. All through the, the, the corpus of Rasa'il, planets are called, uh, uh, in, in Arabic, al in 52 sayyara In 52b, it just becomes, all of a sudden, al nujuma sayyara uh, there are many other uh, um, examples of this kind. Affinities with other individual epistles? Uh, yes, uh, and I have to quote for myself <laughs> in the introduction of the forthcoming book. There are in version 52b extensive passage about Adam and Iblis, the alternating cycles of occultation and unveiling, or the grand sovereignty and the great deputyship that are much reminiscent of the above mentioned esoteric addition to epistle uh, 50 in manuscript Aleph, and to an even greater extent to the Risala al Jamia. Uh, what is surely out of the place here is the idea that this epistle of magic in whichever uh, version should be considered the pinnacle of the entire corpus. It's not even referred to in the, in the classification of the sciences in Epistle 7. Magic is a propagatic uh, science, not at all part of the real, genuine philosophical science. What can we do uh, uh, of, of all this? So my, my impression is that I have a little bit, I've changed my mind a little bit with respect to what I published uh, 10 years ago in uh, with 50 a but that 
uh, none of these versions is uh, a, a genuine part of the original compilation. So uh, how many epistles in the original compilation? <laughs> so uh, of course, we, ha we have to be very prudent with Rasai Lichon Safa, but I think that we have here indications uh, that we should or we may uh, consider or reconsider the hypothesis that the original compilation consisted of only uh, 50 epistles. What we find usually in ancient medieval, <laughs> in, in ancient literature and modern literature are three types of figures. Okay, I, I will try to speed up. Uh, 52 uh, epistles, 51 and 50. 52 is what we found in uh, the uncritical editions, but it's clearly wrong. Uh, it is also supposed to be found in uh, some uh, sources, but Daniel Desmet has pointed out that these are uh, very poorly reliable sources. 51 is indeed the number that we find in the manuscript edition. But in this case, in this particular case, I would be inclined not to attach to too much importance to this, because I suspect that this could have been interpolation. I think uh, we should also see the external reference, and I should just uh, uh, emphasis that in Tawhidi, so which remains by far or most reliable uh, sources on the Rasayi Lichman Safa, at least for a certain period, um, that he, he, he numbers, he, he says that there are only 50 uh, epistles. And this the same figure appears also, but together with the 151 uh, figure uh, in, the Rudbata, in the traditional manuscript of the Rudbad Hakim. Uh, so that's almost it. Uh, ah, yes, there is one person in the room, I think, who will agree with me that the, the original compilation uh, was uh, made of 50 epistles. It's Paul Walker, because incidentally, in uh, one in, in the introduction to uh, his volume, uh, he says this. One explanation is that he is referring to the material of epistle uh, 51 was originally added to 32 in order to include its subject matter in the Rasail without forming out, out of it a separate epistle which would increase the total number beyond 50, 50 being what was originally planned for the all. So I think we <laughs> clearly agree on that. Last thing, uh, but it's certainly not final conclusion, it's just uh, some ideas, some uh, observations. What about the connection between the Rasa and the, Risa, and the Risa al Jamia? I just want to mention something that uh, um, Carmela uh, stressed in her introduction, uh, talking about the ambiguous allusions to the Risa al Jamia in uh, the Atif Effendi. She says, from these words, it is perhaps possible to infer that according to Atif's version, Epistle 50 is a first draft of the Jamia. I'm not sure, I'm, I completely agree with that, but I would be inclined to view Epistle 50 as a kind of climax uh, of, the, of, the, of the process. So in way of conclusions, yes, I, I definitely think that Epistle 50 is a kind of inflection point in the, in the, in the transmission or the redaction or the compilation, I don't know how to, how to refer to that, that it is the last genuine epistle, that it is the culmination of the initiation process, and regarding uh, the epistles I've uh, been uh, talking about, uh, what is striking striking is that there are those with the maximal doctrinal, doctrinal charge, in my view, there are those with the most polarized tradition between more Ismaili uh, manuscript and lesser uh, Ismaili manuscript, and very interesting to note, the only ones with possibly some early connection with the Risalat al Jamia. Uh, thank you very much. Um, As is known, the philosopher generally adopted the monotheism to explain the origin of the world. Although it certainly was a step forward from eternalism, the derivation of the various hypostases from the one occurred by necessity. Divine voluntarism and omnipotence at the basis of creation were completely nullified. Hence, the monotheism collided with the Quranic doctrine which even the philosopher more or less formally unanimously defended. 
The Ismailis, too, were fascinated by the ancient Neoplatonic doctrines. According to tradition, it was the thinker and propagandist Muhammad al Nasafi who introduced those doctrines into Islam. But the Ismailis distinguished themselves from the Falasifa by introducing the concept of Ibda. Ibda transposes the Quranic Amr, the divine imperative, into philosophical language. This, in turn, is none other than the world Kun, which, according to the holy book, initiated the creative process. Therefore, while emanation is necessary, Ibda is due to the divine will. Thus, emanatism was definitely reconciled with religion, while aspects alien to the Quran were placed within the esoteric interpretation of the holy book. The concept of Ibda is also found in the Ikhwan Safa and in the Risala al Jamia, the crown of the epistles, which is supposed to explain their esoteric meaning. This was one of the reasons that led me to consider the authors of the encyclopedia to be close to Ismailism. This paper offers some findings on, of an ongoing research that compares the way how the Ikhwan and the Jamia present Ibda with its various treatments in the works of the many representatives of philosophical Ismailism. The basic idea is that if points of contact are found between the various contexts, it is possible to date the works I'm concerned with on the basis of textual evidence. This research also appears justified by the consideration of Mohammed Abu Ali Alibai, the editor of Abu Yaqub Sijistani's Sulam Najat. He distinguishes three types of Neoplatonism in Islamic thought of Al Kindi, Al Farabi, and the Ikhwan Safa, indicating in the latter the possible antecedents of Sijistani's Neoplatonism, without forgetting to emphasize the issue, already debated at his time, of the Ikhwan's possible Ismaili affiliation. Today, however, for the sake of time, I will compare the encyclopedia and the Jamia, mainly with an older thinker and propagandist, Abu Hatim al-Razi. However, it should be noted that, according to Ali Bhai, the Ikhwan do not speak of Ibda in the Ismaili sense. Indeed, he even counts the brethren among the Eternalists. If I'm not mistaken, the term Ibda occurs in the encyclopedia 29 times, usually in association with Ikhtira. It's very often referred to God. See, for example, this passage where Ibda is brought back to the Quranic dimension of creation, though it is not a Quranic term. Ibda is explained as existentiation from nothing. Whereas, as is known, creation is the existentiation of one thing from another. From the standpoint of my research, the most interesting passage is the one from episode 35 on the intellect and the intelligible. Paradoxically, the term Ibda does not occur here, but only the verb Abda. The context identifies the causes of beings, including hypostasis of Neoplatonic origin, according to Aristotle's fourfold division. The part that interests us is this. This passage organizes the hypostasis hierarchically according to the principle that the higher a thing is in degree, the less it needs connotations. The intellect is placed at a higher degree than the soul, and to the soul he transmits the perfection received from the creator. The intellect is perfect and outside time. God originated him without mediation, that is, without means or aids. In the second part of the passage, the intellect is assimilated to the divine imperative and the Holy Spirit. Finally, creation is brought back to God because the imperative comes from him and identified with the physical world because it is not out of nothing, while the imperative gives, gives rise to spiritual substances, in our case, the Neoplatonic hypostasis. In the Jamia too, the term Ibda recurs 29 times, at least in Ghalib's edition, on which I based myself while waiting for the IIS to publish the new edition by Murad Kashimi and Wilfred Madelung, to whom my thoughts are addressed today. And uh, even here, God is often said to be at the beginning of the process. But uh, since the work is entirely permeated by the idea of the absolute unknowability and ineffability of God, 
which in some places leads to a real negative theology, it seems that in some cases, when speaking of God, it alludes instead to the intellect. The Jamia, moreover, does not fail to mention both this position. Emblematic of the above-mentioned ambiguity is the following passage, in which the subject is the entity assimilated to the number one. The Ikhwana Safa make the assimilation of God to number one along the lines, the lines of Plotinus and the Falasifa one of the cornerstones of their doctrine. But here, first of all, is found the term Maujud, which certainly cannot be referred to God. Therefore, in accordance with Ismaili doctrines, it must be assumed that the entity in question is the intellect, with regard to which in many passages the soul is conceived as second. Then the intellect here plays the very role of God, because generosity, Jude, is referred to him, an attribute that the Ikhwan always referred to God. Finally, the concluding assimilation to the Ibda, or rather to the first Ibda, the second, which we shall see is the soul, definitely excludes that this line speak of God. In no way could it be asserted that God coincides with this word. Similarly to text three above of, of, from the encyclopedia, the Jamia also distinguishes between a spiritual creation and the physical creation. Speaking of the spiritual creation, it says, as you can see in the handout, and here the spiritual entities are said to be created instantaneously through the Ibda, which is considered to be the most perfect creation. The entire part that follows would seem to refer to God, but the ambiguities reappear a few lines later when the entity to whom the subsequent creation is attributed is said to be the preceder that appears, then close to him there is the annexed follower, namely the universal soul that proceeded from him and was in invented through its mediation. Through her, the essences are originated of all the, the existing means, and the noblest of their status is the being that is life. Preceder, in Paul Walker's translation, is according to Ismaili authors the intellect, and so is in this passage. Here the terminology could remind doctrines of later Ismailis, such as Sigistani and Hamid Adin al Kirmani, but let us focus on Abu Hatim al Razi. Let us begin with this Kitab al Islah, the book of correction, where the author refutes the views that an Asafi is said to have expressed in a Kitab al Mahsul, the book of product now lost. Excerpts from this work will also be quoted, as is known, in Kirmani's Kitab al Riyadh, the book of Midas, but anonymously, perhaps because, according to the Riyadh's editor, Arif Tamer, the attribution to Nasafi was believed to be erroneous. The ontocosmological part of Islah opens with the refutation of Anasafi's idea that the soul, the third hypostasis of Neoplatonism, is not perfect. That the discussion begins with the soul and not with, with God or the intellect may appear surprising, but the reason seems to be that the soul is at the root of cosmogony in that, as Shinomoto summarizes, it manifests form, that is nature, from matter. To use the terminology of the Ikhwan and the Jamia, the soul is the junction point between the spiritual world and the physical world. The first mention of Ibda in Islah is as follows. As in text 3, Harazi says that the first intellect is one thing with time. Then we read, therefore there is no time before the Ibda, but it and the Ibda are one being, and the hit the intellect and time are one being, and he and perfection are one being, because the creator originated all beings instantaneously, and the first originated being is the summa of beings and his perfection. And the second which proceeds from the first is also perfection, because it with time are two entities proceeding from the first. This passage is found in the discussion on the perfection or imperfection of the soul's act. Though I don't have time to go into detail on this issue here, 
It shows, it shows a number of similarities with passages from the Ikhwan and the Jamia. We have just read texts 6 and 7. Let us see now for the Ikhwan the following passage. The same hierarchy as we saw in text 3 recurs here. The intellect is still equivalent to Alibda al awwal as in text 5 from the Jamia and he is preceded by God's word and omnipotence and united with his imperative. And the Jamia says, and these are the similarities I've highlighted in red. Negative theology is also reflected in numerous expressions of Abu Hatim, such as the following. An explanation of the identity between Ibda and Al-Mubda al awwal can perhaps be found in Abu Hatim's entry on the term Amr in his Kitab al-Zina, the Book of Adornment. Amr denotes the bringing into existence of all things by God. The same part of Quran 7, 54 that we saw in text 3 of the Ikhwan is then quoted, and Amr is distinguished from Khalq. For Abu Hatim, the Amr coincides with the Kalima or, as is inferred from the subsequent Quranic quotation, with the divine Kun, that is, the creative agent. He compares the verse with the prologue of the Gospel of John, but notes that the verse is Ashaddu Ikhtisaran, far more concise. Later, and quite interestingly, Abu Hatim states that all things that come into existence thanks to the Amr can themselves be called Amr because, I quote, the cause of a thing takes the place of the thing. Just as, for example, rain is sometimes called sky, also in the Quran. At the end of the entry, the author remarks that the Amr is the word of God from which all things come. Therefore, it is, I quote, the cause between God and his creation. But God's word is also the Quran. And the author mentions that, is, that this equation determined the opposition regarding the status of the Quran, whether it is created or uncreated. This may be due to the ambiguous nature of God's attributes, of course, but also to the impossibility of precisely indicating the existential status of Ibda, that is, of Amr, an issue on which the Ismaili authors never ex express themselves clearly. As for Abu Hatim, if on the one hand he says that the first cause, which is the Ibda, is also for the sages the word of the Creator, whose form is the Kun, and that the intellect and the soul called Aslani are united with, with the word Kalima of the Creator. On the other hand, he remarks that as such, they are superior to every creature. God, in fact, I quote, has placed them as a source of light, purity, tohara, and holiness. And origination is considered to be wahmi, imaginary, because, I quote, its essence does not appear except in the first originated being. And uh, in this passage of the Ikhwan, we read, you can read the text on the screen, and here the peculiar connotation of Ibda as Mahdil Kaun seems to me a proof of the same difficulties and hesitations of Abu Hatim when he had to explain its nature. Despite the similarities of Arazi's passages with the Ikhwan and the Jamia, it should be noted that in the chapters of Kitab al-Zina I examined, the term Ibda never occurs. I would like to examine now the part of Islah where Abu Hatim considers the pair Al-Qada or Al-Qadar and cites a Nasafi's thesis that Al-Qada is the Sabiq and Al-Qadar the Tali. According to Razi, Al-Qadar precedes Al-Qada, because Al-Qadar means Taqdir and Al-Qada means Tafsil, and there is no Tafsil except after Taqdir. The test goes on saying that all beings proceed from the Sabiq and that they are Muqaddara. Therefore, the fact of proceeding is the essence of Al-Qadar, which is the summa of all beings, determined in it in potentiality 
by the first being. Al-Qada al is below Al-Qadr and is encompassed by it. And the situation is detailed in this passage. Another interesting point is when Abu Hatim reports that Ali ibn Abi Talib said that Al-Qada wal Qadr are the imperative that came from God and then added the first word of Quran 17.23, Thy Lord hath decreed that he worship none but him. The Ikhwan also mentioned worship and in a context in which the divine Kudra is mentioned, though the issue whether here the Kudra is the same as in text 15 above has still to be fully explored. And this is the text. Here Ibda, that is the intellect, accomplishes the supreme form of worship, which in the encyclopedia is the one proper to angels. And the intellect is perhaps also an angel in this vision. Much more could be said on the ways in which Al-Razi, Anasafi, the Ikhwan and the Jamia speak or of, of, the, of the perfection or imperfection of the universal soul. The shared terminology is indeed striking, and a careful analysis leads, leads us to conclude that there could have been a mutual knowledge of the works of the various authors. In conclusion, what has been exposed so far seems to bring back to a much earlier time doctrines that we used to refer to Sigistani or Kirmani. The ontology of Neoplatonic origin has been rearranged in different ways, but with solutions that show some important similarities. The role gradually attributed to the divine word for the sake of a better conformity to the Quranic doctrines, albeit characterized in different ways, leads to a radical transformation of the two Neoplatonic hypostases, the intellect and the soul. A first step will then be to see if and to what extent the later elaboration differ from the earlier ones. It is also from these results that any future attempt at a chronological and doctrinal placing of the encyclopedia and the Jamia will depend. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Now we open the floor for questions. I think we have about 10 minutes or so. We are, so the, according to the schedule, we, we're pushing 15 minutes on the schedule for the sake of those online as well.